How do they do it? How do they keep making each episode of Shogun so fascinating? Episode 5 of Shogun Broken to the Fist is a real roller coaster ride of emotions. Joy, sorrow, tension, relief, questions, answers, all wrapped up in the beautiful cinematography, sets, locations, and costumes that we've come to know and love from Shogun. I suppose I sound like a massive shill for Shogun at this point, doing nothing but singing its praises. But let me just say that I almost knocked this episode down to a 9 out of 10. At times, I was very mad at the show. No, bad show. Don't do that. But then I realized that what the show had done was make me care about the characters. I can't punish Shogun for doing that. That's why I'm giving Shogun Episode 5 a 10 out of 10. It's not perfect. I still do have some nitpicks, but I believe that they achieved everything they set out to do with this episode. I've watched this episode three times now, and every viewing I pick up on more nuance. Subtle motions from actors, the way dialogue is structured, how previous actions came back to influence current events. My mind is running wild with future permutations of the actions shown in this episode. Blackthorn's realising that maybe he doesn't fully understand the situation, and that his every action has consequences. Fujisama is showing herself to be our girl. I'm not the matchmaking type, but I'm hoping her relationship with Blackthorn can develop more in future episodes. A new power emerges in the battle for control of the land. This changes everything. I can't say much more without spoiling the plot, so go watch it now if you haven't already. If you're one of those people who has heard Shogun is good, but has decided to wait to a later date to watch it, you know, a rainy weekend where there's nothing good on TV, stop. Stop what you're doing now, go get a Hulu trial, and watch it now. Have you ever finally watched a TV show and binged the whole thing overnight and wished you'd watched it sooner? But because no one demanded you watch it, you just kept putting it off? I did that with House of the Dragon. I did it with Deadwood. I did it with Arrested Development. Well, now I'm stopping you from making the same mistake. I demand you watch it. Sign up for a free trial. I don't have any affiliate links, just Google Hulu. What I want is the viewing figures to go up so they make more of this kind of thing. Anyway, let's get into the spoilers. Episode 5 of Shogun begins with the cleanup from the murder of Josen by Nagakado, Toronaga's son. Such good prop design. Great sound design too. The wet slapping of body parts on the wagon really sells the idea that these are chunks of man flesh rent asunder by chain shot. Top marks. He's back! My main man Toronaga has returned with his army. At first I was confused because they were riding under a red standard which I thought were Kiyama's colours. The lens flare in this scene made it very hard to discern who we were even looking at. It's Toronaga, but we've never seen him in full armour before. We've seen it in episode 2, but only fleetingly and it is now shrouded in mist and god rays. Buntaro lives! I can't tell if that look on Mariko's face is her shock at knowing she'll have to put up with his abusive ass again, or if she's realising it was a bad idea to knock boots with Anjin Sama. Lady Achiba, the mother of the air, is returning from Edo, where Toronaga has supposedly held her captive. In episode 1 it was claimed that Lord Toronaga's daughter-in-law was Lady Achiba's sister, and she was visiting to help with the birth of her child. In episode 2, when the Taiko was dying, Lady Achiba was there giving Toronaga knowing glances. They've got to be in cahoots. She's been shown to disdain the Christians, and she knows that Toronaga has the heir's best interests in mind. The Taiko even suggests that there was a time when Achiba could have been married to Toronaga. The tangled web they're weaving. So it seems to my eyes that they light some sort of incense burner when a representative of the council is absent. Toronaga is absent, so there's one in his place. They need to replace Toronaga so that the council can vote on his impeachment, but they all have objections to those suggested. Sugiyama seems to have caught the flux from too many bars. He's coughing his lungs up, not sure he's going to make it to the impeachment. 
Is Shogun trying to say that impeachment proceedings are only brought forward by corrupt bureaucrats who are only looking after their own interests? Very topical. Buntaro made it out alive because there was some Ronin who helped him to escape. Mariko has been writing down everything that Blackthorn has said and done since Toronaga left. Toronaga has instructed her to stay at Blackthorn's house and for Buntaro to move in so she can serve them both. That's not going to cause issues. Toronaga gifts Blackthorn a pheasant that his falcon Lady of Steel has caught. Toronaga is trying to work out whose idea it was to murder Josen. He doesn't think his son would come up with the idea on his own. He berates Nagakado seemingly for becoming someone else's pawn. He almost did it. He narrowly avoided saying the name of the episode. Toronaga wouldn't fall for such a simple trick. Toronaga seems to be telling his son that some men are lazy and will attack anything that you throw out in front of them. Like Yabushigi searching for the spy. Give him an easy kill and he will be happy. The subtlety of the acting in this scene where Shido receives Josen head in the mail. Modern TV shows would have him flailing around the room swearing vengeance, but Shogun has subtlety. The barely controlled emotion signified by the struggle to maintain a regular breathing pattern. The anger shown only in the eyes and the inability to put the lid back on the bucket. Marvellous stuff. Now for one of the most important scenes of the episode. Blackthorn receives the pheasant, and in the way of the English he hangs it to mature. But the Japanese know this will stink the place up. Blackthorn tries to tell them not to touch it the best he can, but he only knows the words no, die, and touch. You might think this is just a throwaway scene. Haha, <laughs> look at how the Englishman turned a fine game bird into typical English slop. But this is far more involved than that. Fuji is telling the house staff that Anjin Sama can eat whatever he wants in his own house. But it doesn't mean that the rest of them have to. That's when Buntaro appears. The guy's a jerk. I got a pretty big grin on my face when Buntaro asked Fuji how it was like being a consort to a barbarian. She shut him down quick smart by telling him she wouldn't know. She's the consort to a Hatamoto. I thought she put her foot in it when she said that he likes to pillow with other women, but I don't think Buntaro caught on. Probably because he has such disdain for Mariko, he wouldn't see why anyone else would sully themselves by pillowing with that trash. Although Buntaro does have the base, barbarians should stick to barbarian women hot take. So Fuji is Buntaro's niece. All these families are intermarried, it's so tangled. Poor old Yabashi. He tried to lump the killing of Josen onto Nagakado, then onto Omi. But it turns out that Toronaga thinks it was a good idea because he never would have been able to win if the other Busho stayed in Osaka. But now there's a chance that will come to him. So Toronaga rewards Omi with command of the Cannon Regiment. Our man Yabs can't take a trick. When Yabushigi tells Omi that he's command of the Cannon Regiment, Omi tries to placate him by offering to relinquish command back, but Yabushigi says that he can't relinquish that which he doesn't own. Yabs is sending his pirate friend back to Osaka to smooth things over with Ashido, because he still thinks things are going to go against Toronaga. They are 4 to 1 Bushos against them. <laughs> That's one stinky pheasant. I guess if you can eat natto, you can put up with some stinky pheasant stew. I wouldn't even know what a pheasant tastes like. Chicken, I assume. Poor old Ujiro reckons it's worse than that time they ate silkworms cooked in soy sauce. Filth. These ladies can really pack away the grub. I love it how they basically toss the food into the back of their gullets. Ujiro is putting together quite the rock garden. Blackthorn seems to be enjoying his company. Oh man, this scene turned around so fast I got whiplash. At first it's a nice, funny scene about how people eat and how their table manners are different. Then it devolves into a drinking contest. I had a few chuckles. I thought after the toast Blackthorn gave that they might have started to become drinking buddies. How wrong I was. Blackthorn asks for Buntaro to tell him the story of his escape from Osaka, but he refuses as heroism is for the dead 
and stories are for children. When Blackthorn insists, he gets a bow and shoots some arrows past Mariko's face into a fence post he can't even see. Wow. The tension in this scene just went through the roof. Mariko doesn't move a muscle as she must endure the abuse. Insane behaviour. Poor old Fuji does her best to try and maintain dignity in her household, but it's no use. Blackthorn says that a man should treat his wife with respect, and that sends Buntaro off. He demands Mariko tell him who she is. Her father killed the Emperor because of his cruelty. Then Mariko's family was hunted down and her father was forced to execute them all before committing Sudoku himself. The tension in the air is so thick you should cut it with a knife. That night, Buntaro beats the crap out of Mariko and Blackthorn tries to intervene, but Buntaro has already left. These poor women are treated worse than dogs and they put up with it to save face. I felt so sorry for both of them. The problem is, if you try to change one aspect of the culture, the rest will close around it to reinforce it. Blackthorn faces down Buntaro in the street. I thought he was going to blow his head off, but that would have just made things worse. I also thought Buntaro was going to draw steel, but I think he realised that he brought shame upon his host's household and had to throw himself at his mercy. Buntaro says it was the Saki, but I guess Blackthorn's hands are tied. If he kills him, things will become a nightmare for his entire household. Buntaro gives Blackthorn the death glare as he walks away. Cut to the two arrows stuck in the fence posts, possibly foreshadowing an attempt on Blackthorn's life by Buntaro in a later episode. Miraji is meeting with Toronaga at his pigeon hideout. Toronaga informs him that Yabushiki is looking for a spy, so he offers to surrender himself. Toronaga doesn't want that because he's his most trusted samurai. Oh man, I did not see that coming. I just thought he was some old fisherman making a bit of spare coin by sending news. The staff at Blackthorn's house are saying that the villagers think that a vengeful spirit has possessed their house. Poor Fuji tries to get Blackthorn to let them take the pheasant away, but he doesn't understand her and is too intent on finding Mariko. Mariko doesn't want to be seen with Blackthorn, but Blackthorn doesn't care. He's trying to get her to be free, but he doesn't see that in this culture that's just not possible. She says that they do things because that is what the person deserves, like Fujisawa, whose father's swords weren't even his. He died a coward and her grandfather bought the swords to save her the shame. They all know and they don't say anything because that is what she deserves. Mariko will stay with her husband out of spite and give him nothing in return because that is what he deserves. From today, Mariko will not speak to Blackthorn unless it is to translate. What a bummer of a scene. This is the start of the part of the show that I was going to deduct a point for. It hurt to watch, and I didn't like it. But now on reflection, I see that it's the downward part of the story's arc that we need in order to reach the triumphant end. Speaking of downer scenes, this one nearly broke me. Blackthorn returns to the village and everyone is moping around. He asks where the pheasant went. Yujiro took it down. When Blackthorn has a giggle, and asks where he is, they tell him that he's dead. He can't believe they would do such a thing, and Fuji offers her life as she is responsible. Blackthorn can't believe that they would behave like this. This scene made me choke up. My poor old mate Ujiro, I was hoping that him and Blackthorn would become good friends, but now he's dead, and over a stupid bird. And then she offers her own head to make up for a wrongful death, utter madness. It really shows how out of his depth Blackthorn is, and that as lord of the house, his word is law no matter how stupid. Such a sad scene. I wonder if they made that bit of snow fall off the roof on purpose, or if it was a happy little accident. Blackthorn goes to see Toronaga to ask to leave Japan, because he doesn't want to be a part of their way of life. Mariko informs him that the town had a meeting and they decided someone had to take the bird. Yujiro said he'd been ill lately, so he would take one for the team. Blackthorn says why kill him over a worthless bird, to which Mariko informs him that his words gave it value. 
He said anyone who touches it should be killed, and so it came to be. I did feel sorry for Blackthorn here. He was just using the few Japanese words he knew to try to convey the meaning of don't touch the bird. He never meant for it to be a death sentence, but now he's realising that he's just as much to blame for his ignorance. Toronaga can't be bothered with this bull dust, so he goes and stretches his legs. Just then, an earthquake hits, and all of the establishing shots of dripping water suddenly make so much sense as the ground liquefies beneath his feet. Toronaga is buried, and Blackthorn races to find him to dig him out. They must have paid good money for this stuntman, as he really throws himself into the fall down the hillside. After digging Toronaga out and whacking him on the back to dislodge the soil in his lungs, he comes around. And once again, I got a stray eyelash in my eye or something, as Blackthorn offered Toronaga Fujisama's father's swords to replace Toronaga's buried swords. Does Toronaga know that they weren't Fujisama's father's swords? but those of a drunken samurai who sold them for three bags of rice? Will Fuji be upset that Blackthorn gave away her family heirloom? Or will she be happy that her lord is now carrying her father's weapons? Will Toronaga actually carry them? Or have them destroyed in a new set of higher quality swords commissioned? Did he accept them because a samurai needs to have his swords at all times? Or did he only accept them because it would be rude to refuse? I'm hoping he continues to carry them and that Fuji will be happy. Uh oh, the landslide has swept away a large portion of his army that was camped in the valley. Blackthorn returns home again to find poor Fuji laid out with staff attending to wounds on her back. Blackthorn touchingly holds her hand and has a look of deep concern on his face. He gets up and puts Yujiro's rock back upright. When they cut back to Fuji, I thought she was dead. She wasn't moving. I was going to turn it off there, but she moved. She seems to be realising that Blackthorn cares for her well-being. This scene makes me sad and happy at the same time. Miraji is showing Yabushigi and Omi the evidence they found of Ijiro being a spy. Of course, we all know that he planted the evidence so that Yabushigi would stop searching for a spy therefore allowing Miraji or Tonomoto Akino, as he's known to his friends, to continue spying unhindered. Lady Achiba is back in Osaka after her captivity in, in Ido. She's acting weird when the nun says she's glad that she returned safely. Like she's surprised people think she was in danger. Ishido visits and she basically puts him in his place, almost like she's goading him into going to war with Toronaga. The episode ends with Lady Achiba telling Ishido the time for politics is over, the council will answer to me. Damn! Hurry up Tuesday! Such a great episode, yet again. What can I say that I haven't said already? It just maintains the high bar that previous episodes have set. Like I said in the intro, I'm giving Shogun Episode 5 Broken to the Fist a 10 out of 10. The worst thing about this episode is that it means that we are halfway through the season already. I don't want each episode to end, let alone the season. Perfection is everywhere. Brilliant casting, brilliant sets, brilliant locations, props, acting, dialogue, plot. I'm loving everything about Shogun. I wonder if I would like it as much as I do if it were released all at once. Does having the episodes weekly give me more of an opportunity to digest the events of the latest episode and think about the ramifications of the character's actions? And now the country itself has become a character, with earthquakes and landslides becoming a massive threat to life as well as plans. I thought the Council of Regents would remain paralysed for the foreseeable future, but now with the return of Lady Achiba, she could whip them into shape and make the decisions on the fifth member for them. Maybe slot Yabushigi in there to see where his allegiances lie. I'm no feminist, but I would like to see the women in this show, especially Mariko and Fuji, get some sort of justice for their poor treatment. I'm hoping Blackthorn can bring things together into a more harmonious home and take care of dear Fuji. I hate to see her suffer. I just hope that the lack of diversity won't hinder Shogun come awards time. 
People are already noticing the lack of black people, and I understand some awards require quotas to be met both in front of and behind the camera. Gaming has already been through this, and the excuse of, but it's set in X country in Y period, doesn't cut it with some people. But hey, if this is the quality of TV shows we can get without diversity, maybe diversity can take one for the team every now and then. Hell, I'd watch another series based entirely on the Japanese before the English and even the Portuguese arrived. 100% Japanese people, zero diversity, yes please. Shogun keeps delivering the goods, so here's to another five brilliant episodes. Thanks for watching. If you like what you saw, please consider subscribing. I release reviews occasionally when time allows, and a thumbs up would be a big motivator for further reviews. If you didn't like it, feel free to leave a thumbs down and let me know how I can improve in the comments below. Anyway, I'm Mixie, thanks for your time, and have a good one.